Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, you know, if you're joining us from Hong Kong, as one of our faculty discussants is um, almost good night. Uh, uh, welcome to day two of In and Out of South Asia, Race, Capitalism and Mobility. My name is Jatin Dua and I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of Michigan and Director of the Interdepartmental Program in History and Anthropology on behalf of the Center for South Asia Studies and um, my co fellow co-organizers, Anisha Padma, Irene Pramod, and Swagat Bani, I welcome you um, to uh, day two. Uh, today, our first panel for that, we have three panels um, on our schedule for today. And our first panel is on trade markets and capital. And um, Swagat is going to be the chair of the panel and will introduce the faculty discussants and panelists right afterwards. Um, and then we have a panel on resistance and solidarity and finally our closing panel on um, critiquing the nation part two which in some ways continues some of the themes from um, uh, from yesterday so I will not take up too much space um, because uh, given time uh, and I just want to both welcome everyone here and and in some ways use a few minutes to to think about both the motivations behind this conference and some of the conversations that have already happened and and just to highlight that as threads that I hope we continue through um, throughout this conference. Um, one of the things that has been really exciting um, here has been bringing together uh, a range of scholars, uh, primarily in their kind of early stages, as well as faculty discussants who all have been in many ways beginning with a premise that to think South Asia is to always be thinking in in multiple temporalities, multiple spatialities, and to is to always deterritorialize this notion of what South Asia and what geography and the kind of legacies of area studies is. And so the impetus of this conference, in many ways, is is what happens when we begin there, when we begin by thinking through South Asia as a mobile category, when we begin not only thinking about mobility as, as a kind of unifying category, but also as a category that needs to be perhaps disarticulated to, to, take a, to pay attention to the various kinds of mobility, the various kinds of actors we call mobile. And as Professor Yahya, um, our first faculty discussant yesterday reminded us to sometimes even query the question of mobility, right? Does everything that move need to be called mobile? And if so, you know, is there a sort of celebration of mobility that's inherent in some of our conceptual and intellectual projects? Um, and alongside this, um, what this, uh, you know, this, this conference seeks to read and think with other forms of transregionalism, the Indian, Indian Ocean, namely and most prominently Indian Ocean studies, but also um, conversations around diaspora, um, the Atlantic, and, and that was one thing that came out very significantly in a number of our discussions was that to think South Asia and to think even the Indian Ocean perhaps is also to think across and what happens when we think across various spaces, including spaces of the Atlantic to ask not only about the mobility of goods, people, ideas, but also our conceptual vocabularies. And, and what are the directionalities of our conceptual vocabularies? Where do concepts such as race emerge? Does it even, you know, does it even matter to think of race as, as a concept emerging in a certain place and then being used in, in South Asia, for example? Or do we need to rethink our understandings of not only directionality, but the ontology of um, conceptual vocabularies. And I was really, you know, as, um, as I followed along these conversations, it was incredibly exciting to see how many of you are thinking along these lines and, and thinking about, um, you know, South Asia is always already mobile, but, and in particular through multiple kinds of archives. We had discussions of dictionaries of, um, uh, you know, sort of, again, they could scent and smell was brought up as something to, through which to think about. And part of uh, why I bring that up is 
uh, is a goal of ours is for this conversation to continue to have an afterlife beyond this conference and one of the ways in which we would like to do that and it's something we invite both the panelists the discussants as well as those in the audience to think with us about what are forms of writing that can capture or even that go beyond writing as well so you know what might be how might we use this notion of in and out of south asia and this physical website that we've created to create and, and curate an intellectual conversation so we'll be reaching out to many of you and if you have ideas please reach out to us as well one thing that we are thinking we would like to do is to think in in multimodal ways is to think you know use use these as not just spaces for writing but also spaces for what happens if we think through sound or as one of our panelists um, from the first panel who's working through photography how might how might an essay that foregrounds the photographic um do and and so so this is an invitation to to all of you um, that we look for we really look forward to creating a collaborative space where we can um, where we can curate these kinds of discussions and um, and we look forward to continuing that conversation with you both today but also beyond um, so with that i will turn the um, you know, turn the panel over to our chair for today swagat pani who is a uh, doctoral student in the anthropology and history program and Swagat uh, is going to be now introducing our faculty discussants and panelists. Thank you and I hope you have a productive day. Um, hello everyone. Thanks Professor Dua for your opening remarks. Um, on behalf of the organizing committee consisting of Anisha Padma, Irene Tramod, Professor Dua and myself, I welcome you all to the second day of the In and Out of South Asia conference. We begin with the first panel of the day, titled Trade Markets and Capital. At the outset, I want to thank our faculty discussants, Professor Andrea Wright and Professor Kakinchuk, for agreeing to be part of this panel. I also want to thank all the participants in the panel, as well as the members of the audience for being part of this session. Importantly, I also want to thank Dr. Clemente Buggy for all his support in providing logistics for the conference. I now will lay out the format of the panel. I will begin with a brief introduction of the faculty discussions and the participants in the panel. This will be followed by a 10 minute mini keynote addresses by each of the faculty discussions, followed by five minute presentations by each of the panelists. We are having these brief presentations for the benefit of, of the members of the audience who may not have had the opportunity to watch the videos on the conference website. The presentations will be followed by comments by the first faculty discussant on the paper. After providing their comments on each paper, we request the faculty discussants to wait in case the participants want to respond to the comments before proceeding to the next paper. After the first faculty discussant finishes, the same pattern of comments and responses will be repeated by the second faculty discussant. Finally, we will give the audience an opportunity to ask their questions to the panelists. Now to a brief introduction of the faculty discussants and the panelists. Professor Andrea Wright is an assistant professor of anthropology and Asian and Middle Eastern studies at the College of William and Mary. Professor Wright obtained her PhD in anthropology and history from the University of Michigan. Her research focuses on the histories of capitalism in South Asia, the Arabian Peninsula and the United States. In particular, her research has sought to explore how labor and energy production shape economies, geopolitical dynamics, and social inequalities. Professor Wright's first book titled Dreams and Ghosts, Indian Migration and Middle Eastern Oil is an ethnography of Indian migration to oil and gas projects in the Gulf. The ethnography follows Indian migrants from villages in India to oil projects in the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait and back again. She's currently working on her second book titled Producing Labor Hierarchies, an Anthropological History of Oil in the Arabian Sea. The book is a history of oil production in the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula and focuses on the period between 1930s to the 1970s and examines the process by which worker rights were limited as states and corporations, corporations increasingly associated oil with national security. Professor Wright has also begun research comparing green energy initiatives in the United States, India and Kuwait and focusing on religious beliefs, cultural perspective on what constitutes the environment debates regarding one's ethical responsibility to the environment and differing visions of the future. 
Professor Ka Kinchuk is an assistant professor in the Department of Chinese and History at the City University of Hong Kong. He obtained his doctorate in social and cultural anthropology from St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford. He previously held teaching and research positions at University of Leiden, NYU Shanghai, and Rice University. His recent publications include Transient Migrants at the Crossroads of China's Global Future, published in a special issue of Transitions, Journal of Transient Migration, and Making Mumbai, which is part of an edited volume titled Bombay's Brokers, published by Duke University Press. Having conducted fieldwork over the past decade on the Sikh diaspora in Hong Kong and on Indian traders in southeastern China, is currently developing a new project on transnational flower industry and environmental ethics in China and Scotland. Professor, Professor Chuk also works on Dubai China India connections through Indian Trading Diasporic Network and writes on money circulations across these regions. His ongoing group project is an ethnographic study of third tier Chinese city called Kachao, which is known as Little India in China. Our panelists for today are Dr. Bing Shi or Alice Lin from Harvard University, and her paper will be titled. A rolling Stone Gathers Glass, The Colored Stone Trade Across South and Southeast Asia. Sana Kadri, an independent researcher and host and producer of, of Cafe Khalij, whose paper is titled Traders to Tycoons, The Evolution of Indian Merchant Class in the Political Economy of the UAE. And Shika Dilavri of um, SOAS, University of London, whose paper is titled Tidal Connections, Merchant Itineraries, and Entanglements of Race, Caste, and Capital. Without further ado, I give the floor over to Professor Kakin Chuk for his uh, mini keynote. Yeah, thank you so much, Margaret, and kudos to the organizing teams uh, for the world-class organization of this conference and also yeah, uh, a big thanks to Professor Dua for his very kind invitations. And it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be the faculty discussions for this very interesting interesting panels, uh, trade markets and capital. Yeah, uh, Sparket uh, just kindly introduced my research and you all now know that, yeah, um, my research interest is so closely related to all these kind of like important issues in South Asian anthropology in its global context, trade, connectivity, uh, transregional connections, uh, Middle East, South Asia, East Asia connections, et cetera. Yeah, I have been doing quite a lot of work like, on the Indian diasporic traders in Southeast China, as well as their uh, transregional and global connections, particularly those with uh, their counterparts in Dubai and South Asia. So yeah, I mean, I will be, <laughs> yeah, even though I'm a faculty discussion, I, it is my responsibility uh, uh, to, to give comments and suggestions and critiques, I mean, to the panelists, but it's also a great chance for me to learn from all of you uh, because all of your work has so much to, uh, to uh, so much overlapping with my uh, ongoing research interests uh, in China, India, and the Middle East. So uh, yeah, I think I will just do a very simple thing for this uh, opening remark. And yeah, perhaps I think it will be uh, uh, the, how to say, maybe the best and most productive just to introduce some of my recent work on uh, China, uh, Dubai connections through the Indian trading network. Yeah, just to open up uh, some dialogues and conversations that uh, we all, all the panelists uh, have shared in the studies of uh, connections, um, uh, diaspora market uh, in the global South Asian context. So as Margaret uh, just introduced that I recently have published a paper uh, titled Funny Money Circulations and Fabric Exports uh, from China to Dubai uh, through the Indian Trading Connections. And it is just published this month uh, in American Behavioral Scientists. Yeah, if you are interested, uh, just send me an email and I will be happy to share with you a copy. Yeah, basically in this paper, I what I did is um, to map out the transnational uh, money uh, network and circulations that have linked up uh, Dubai, China, and India through the transnational Indian diasporic, uh, diasporic network. Um, drawing on field work uh, over the last 10 years, not only in China, but also in Dubai and India, the paper found that uh, it is um, increasingly difficult uh, for the long elite, uh, low-skilled Indian traders to assess bank loans, 
credits, uh, the institutional sort of like financializations or finance financing sort of mechanisms in the institutions in Dubai. And it has also becoming uh, more and more difficult for the Longilis Indians to use um, informal money uh, bank transfer, which is well known as Hawala or Hundi in the, uh, in the Middle Eastern context. Um, in both India and Dubai, because as you know, there has been a serious uh, uh, crackdown on bad money circulations and flows in and across the regions over the last several years. Yeah, given that most of the long elite Indian uh, diasporic traders are op operating a uh, cash economy, cash business, yeah, because they want to avoid tax payment to, uh, to, to increase their survival chance uh, in this very competitive trading market, it has become uh, harder and harder for them to uh, survive uh, under this kind of circumstances. But by a stark contrast, in China, uh, drawing on my fieldwork in a place called Kertau, in which it is now known as the Little India, I found the Indian diaspora um, have cultivated quite easy access uh, to informal capital um, that is only available in China, such as the cake bed uh, they will receive from the Chinese suppliers, and more importantly, uh, the test rebates uh, in Chinese Chu Kao Tui Sui, um, uh, that the Chinese suppliers and the Chinese governments are willing to share with the Indian traders in this transnational fabric trade. So my, my, ethnographic, my ethnographic findings show that there has been no strong uh, institutional barriers for the, for the Indian diaspora in China to receive uh, such informal money from the Chinese states and from the Chinese suppliers. And it's largely less formalized uh, when you compare with the financial institutions uh, in Dubai, such as the Hawala and the formal banking services. So as such, um, the elite, as well as the long elite Indians, both of them have access to this informal capital in China. And the outcome, as I found out, is that um, it kind of prevents the over accumulations, uh, over concentrations of wealth, power, and capital by any particular stakeholders, by any particular players in the China Dubai fabric trade. Uh, when we uh, uh, look close uh, into the, the uh, everyday operations of the Indian diasporic trading network. And, and as a consequence, uh, it also kind of sustained the continuous survival at least or ongoing expansions at best, at best uh, for a large number of Indian diasporic traders um, in, uh, who have been very active in the Dubai-China fabric trade. So kind of the conclusion is, yeah, uh, China, uh, the, the global rise of China has played quite an interesting role on reconfiguring the internal power relations within the Indian trading diaspora. Because in the case of Dubai, maybe it's more about like the increasing power inequality, but China, the rise of China somehow has some very indirect effects on reshaping uh, the internal grouping dynamics uh, within the Indian diaspora traders who have been very active in the transnational fabric trade between China and Dubai. So basically, I think, yeah, maybe this paper has particularly, uh, <laughs> is particularly close to uh, the interest of all the panelists because it touched on uh, capital circulations, uh, diasporic network, and, and the market development in China, India, and Dubai. Yeah, so yeah, just, just a very short introduction uh, about that particular paper, but I hope that it will open up some interesting conversations and dialogues uh, uh, in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chuck, for your mini keynote and for your valuable comments. Um, I now call upon Professor Andrea Wright to deliver her mini keynote. Well, um, so first, thank you so much for um, inviting me and thank you for such a incredibly organized conference as well as um, to the participants for providing such rich papers. Um, I thought in my discussant comments, I would focus on, or on these like introductory remarks, mini keynote, I would focus on some key themes I saw in the papers and then uh, provide um, some material for my own on research to uh, illustrate those. So there were three main themes I saw, and one included um, how global supply chains are structured, and in particular, the enduring legacies of both colonial or racialized capitalism and structuring supply chains, as well as the unexpected forms that um, supply chains may take and other networks. 
A second theme I saw was the ways that capitalism incorporates non-capitalist social relations and values into its reproduction. And then the third closely related to this is how diverse actors expand and develop capitalism. So I'm gonna um, now share, a, uh, I guess, a, from my own research, which looks at Indian labor migration um, into the Gulf's oil industry. And one of the sites where I conducted ethnographic research was with uh, recruiting agents or intermediaries um, or um, people who work as intermediaries between companies in the Gulf that want to hire Indian laborers and Indian laborers who are looking for jobs in the Gulf. One um, recruiting agent um, that I knew was Mr. Hussein, which is a pseudonym, of course, um, who is a young man who had um, went to um, college and graduate school in London. And when I met him, he was spending half of his year in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates and the other half in Mumbai. He was um, articulate, outgoing, and engaging. And when I met him, he immediately invited me to his office, which was located on a third floor of an anonymous building in Mumbai. Um, it was a very small office, and he um, largely staffed uh, a certain type of worker for projects. But his office, while small, had a long-standing connection to the Gulf. Um, and his work as a recruiting agent, Mr. Hussein's work as a recruiting agent, followed in the footsteps of both his father and his grandfather. And when he was describing his family history to me, um, Mr. Hussein made a slippage between uh, mangoes and migrants uh, that illustrated to me how the conceptual and material apparatuses that are used to facilitate say, uh, that were used historically to facilitate trade are now used to structure labor migration. Um, and Mr. Hussein's family, he told me, began shipping goods to the um, Arabian Peninsula in the late British colonial period. His grandfather was a customs agent in Mumbai and he had went on Hajj in the early 1940s. Um, while he was on Hajj, Mr. Hussein's grandfather stayed at a guest house where he met people from Oman. And during the conversation, a family from Oman asked him if he could supply, and this is a quote, textiles, construction materials, steel pipes, carpets, mangoes, basically everything, unquote. And Mr. Hussein's grandfather agreed. This meeting proved to be the beginning of a lucrative trading company that focused on exporting materials, and in particular mangoes, from India to the trucial states in Oman. And the trucial states are today the United Arab Emirates. Mr. Hussein's uh, father continued this business and he increased the export of mangoes from India to the Gulf. However, in the late 1970s, the family started, quote, exporting people, unquote, and even as they continued to export mangoes. Now, this changed in the 1990s when the family found that exporting goods had become less lucrative and they began to, quote, export more and more workers, unquote, to the Gulf. And this story, uh, Mr. Hussein was not the only recruiting agent um, whose family was involved in a longer history of trade before entering the recruiting business. Um, another recruiting agent with whom I worked was uh, Mr. Sahil, who is from Gujarat. And um, he uh, like also followed in the footsteps of his father and grandfather. And he estimated that his family had been trading with the Gulf since at least the 1800s. Now, recruiting agents described their work to me as, quote, catching a man and then, quote, exporting him. And this language of commerce in conjunction with the shift from exporting goods to labor, or in Mr. Hussein's terms, from mangoes to migrants, um, highlights the commodification of labor that occurs as rural farmers take jobs in India. And I work mostly with um, people working as manual laborers. The view of migrants as commodities is reinforced by, by the marketization of labor in a field where people are hired from multiple countries. And this marketization is often envisioned in India by government officials recruiting agents as a competition between nation states, which further reinforces the category of migrant as an export commodity. So while recruiting agents are often act rooted in these histories of trade and religious pilgrimage, oil company practices have roots in British colonial capitalism and ge geostrategic competition. Indian laborers began working in the Gulf um, in 1908 when um, we discovered oil is discovered in Persia today, Iran. And oil became increasingly important after, to the British after Winston Churchill in 1911 decided to use oil power to uh, oil to power the British Navy. Um, Hoping to maintain and extend Britain's control in the Gulf, the British government obtained oil concessions from the rulers of the Gulf countries. And of course, the British were not the only people who were interested in developing the Gulf's oil fields. And in order to keep out other um, imperial interests, including Russians and Americans, the British administration insisted that British subjects, including persons from British India, staff oil projects. So this staffing was possible given the already strong presence of Indians in the Gulf, um, but also the fact that many British managers of oil companies had begun their careers in British India um, before moving across the Arabian Sea to work in the oil industry. Um, 
the staffing of Indians and oil projects became even more important um, as political unrest um, and imperial competition increased. And in the 1960s, strikes by Gulf Arab workers were um, very costly to oil companies. And oil company managers characterized these strikes as both threats to the, the um, government, but also as threats to corporate security. And in response, oil companies decided to preferentially hire South Asian workers because they believed these workers were both more loyal to the British, but also because they could be, quote, fired without any um, consequence at all. Now, Throughout the 20th century, oil companies wanted cheap and easily replaceable labor. And in the early 20th century, the British government used the same system that was used to move indentured workers from plantations throughout the British Empire to um, move workers to the oil fields. And this system continues today with the protector of immigrant system. Um, and what I wanna just pull out here is that the logic of colonial labor mobilities informs migration, but as um, Mr. Hussein's um, family history and other recruiting agency family histories demonstrate, migration is also shaped by religious trade and localized networks. The poetic of mangoes and men points to the role of history and bureaucratic process in the production of labor migration and emigration, emigration processes often deploy the same structures to move goods, reinforcing global market views that both are commodities. Um, migrants, government bureaucrats and recruiting agents, as well as the employees at recruiting agencies, oil company managers are all actively involved in this migration. And as they do so, they develop, maintain and navigate immigration restrictions and their accompanying bureaucratic hurdles. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wright, for your mini keynote and for your comments. Um, I now call upon the panelists to present their works. We will begin first with a presentation from Dr. Bing Shi O. Alice Lin. Hi, um, let me just share my PowerPoint. Are you on the PowerPoint? Uh, do you see the PowerPoint? One second. Oh. Okay. So um, hi everyone, and um, I'm really just delighted to be here. And I want to thank all the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference that brings together so many people from so many places in the world. Um, I'm also really excited to hear the thoughts of Professor Wright and Professor Chuck on each of our papers. Um, so my paper um, comes out of a dissertation project that is on the colored stone, the gemstone trade in, in and from Pakistan. Um, my research is situated in at the intersection of studies of capitalism and commodities and also what we mean by quality, um, qualities of nature or qualities of beauty, high quality, low quality, um, as well as systems of production and circulation that go into making value. Um, so this project wasn't motivated by my interest in capitalism. It was more by my own interest in the cultural and sort of historical significance of gems in the region. Uh, and which you know, complicates the role of gems as, as key commodities um, in a place where I conducted research um, in the borderlands of Pakistan and Afghanistan. So uh, in this paper, I don't really go into the South Asian uh, marketplace at all, even though it was my principal field site. Uh, for somewhat selfish reasons, I wanted to use this panel as a way to think through how I could connect um, these different marketplaces that were linked through um, a, a group of dealers, a community of, of gem dealers from Peshawar who are at the center of my research. Um, and I had trouble incorporating this aspect, this extended aspect of the trade into my, dissertation, uh, into my dissertation chapters without it being too geographically expansive and thus you know, losing an ethnographic thickness. So um, this material on the marketplace of the colored stones in southern, uh, southeastern Thailand is, is quite preliminary, but it, it constitutes an important story um, of the gem trade in, in Pakistan, but also globally. Um, so my, my recorded presentation is divided into two parts. Um, I sort of, I begin with um, a moment in field work um, in Thailand where, let me just move from, can you see my, are my slides ch changing? Yes. Um, so yeah, so this, I'm just showing you a map for where I did research, and this is where my research took me in Thailand. Um, so I started with this moment of field work in Thailand where I boarded a bus from Bangkok to Chantaburi, along with my interlocutors, um, mostly dealers from Peshawar and 
Kabul. And I described the sort of um, multinational, uh, multi-ethnic trading scene at the Chantaburi gem market called Talat Ploy. Um, and also the systematic ways in which gems are, you know, traded through back and forth haggling between buyers and sellers. Um, and then I also give a, a brief overview of how the, of sort of the, how the market work, the marketplace works um, in this, in this specific, uh, in, in Chantaburi. Um, has some atypical characteristics where in the sense that this marketplace, it is not the buyers who are moving and mobile, but rather the sellers who are mobile. So buyers are seated, whereas um, uh, sellers, uh, the, the middlemen move around the marketplace showing gems. Um, so this is a table, for example, of uh, for where buyers usually sit and then... So, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interject, uh, but the slide hasn't moved. I or is it just me? Oh, oh, uh, okay. Sorry, uh, I thought it was moving. Okay, is it moving now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, so here's a a, a map. Um, uh, so this is where I did my research, and this is where um, the the beginning vignette in my paper um, it takes place, and yeah. So as I was saying, that I um, in the in the in the ethnographic vignettes, I talk about how I uh, boarded a bus from Bangkok to Chandaburi and then ended up in this very vibrant trading uh, market for gemstones, um, which is kind of like a key uh, market, key hub uh, for trading colored stone gems in, within, um, in Thailand and also regionally. So, um, and then I talked a little bit about the inner workings of the market where buyers are seated, sellers are moving about, um, then I move on to question what, um, you know, what it means for dealers from Pakistan or Afghanistan to be uh, you know, those who are mobile with enough capital to move outside of Pakistan to be pursuing um, this kind of trade in Chantaburi. So in the second part of my paper, I then turn to uh, the history of Chantaburi, a very brief one, um, and show how it moves from being a site of extraction, of, of mining, to one of processing. Um, so, and, I, and I'm trying to think through uh, this notion of a resource, um, framing these a marketplace like Chantaburi's uh, gem market as a resource frontier, um, thinking about the notion of a resource and expanding it to include uh, that which transforms geographies of trade um, or circulation of, of, of gems, of capital, uh, which enable the participation of, of traders from the global south. So the, the kinds of extraction I am talking about here is not, are not the large scale uh, mining of, of tin, copper or gold that is widely documented in the environmental history of Southeast Asia. Um, I used mostly sources on, based on travel logs of missionaries and colonial era contractors who uh, talk about this um, small scale artisanal mining of gems um, that began as early as the mid 1800s, um, this mining uh, uh, mining activities were usually um, undertaken by, by a, the Shan community of, of Myanmar, um, but they were quickly overtaken by European contractors, as in the mines themselves, um, who were also otherwise mining in other parts of Southeast Asia, right, in under European colonization and in Burma, Myanmar, um, Cambodia, or Vietnam. Um, and then towards the end of my paper, I fast forward to the last century and, and, uh, and by the 1990s, most of these mines have been depleted of, of rubies, but it remains a sort of really important place uh, for trading. And um, as over the last few decades, Thailand became a regional hub for not only gem trade, but also for gem processing, for heat treatment and cutting um, with you know, the city of Chantaburi at its center. Um, and so those who were wishing to um, apply heat treatment to their rough minerals, they would go to Jantaburi, get them heated, and then have them sold by, by these hawkers in the, in the marketplace. So yeah, so um, yeah, so basically in this, in this paper, I've just shown that marketplaces for gemstones, which have sort of sprung up in several places across South and Southeast Asia, show that there is resource extraction um, interests kind of coincide with colonial commercial interests and histories, and they involved into different forms of, of places of exchange. Um, 
and uh, yeah, I would just, uh, so I'll, I'll end there and uh, I look forward to hearing um, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alice Lynn, for your presentation. I now request uh, Sana Kadri to present her work. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Dubai and um, many thanks uh, to the team at Center for South Asian Studies for having me on board for this conference. Um, I won't last even five minutes and uh, I wish I could uh, uh, start with the slides, but then my system has suddenly started running Microsoft updates. So uh, yes, I'll be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, so the paper that I presented was um, uh, titled uh, From Traders to Tycoons, the Evolution of the Indian uh, Merchant Diaspora in the UAE uh, since 1971. And uh, this develops from my master's thesis that I completed for my MA in Middle Eastern Studies. Um, what motivated me uh, to focus uh, on this topic uh, was that the dominant focus, a uh, scholarly focus when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, migration uh, in GCC, uh, the focus has been only on the labor and professional uh, migrant uh, class in the region, but uh, not on the uh, merchant and the trading diaspora who is uh, active presence around the uh, Arabian Peninsula have you know dates dates back several centuries, and they were the first wave of migrants to come uh, from South Asia. Uh, so um, my research was basically, uh, you know, uh, was basically interested in making, drawing out the connections and the disconnections between uh, the experiences of the group of entrepreneurs, businessmen that have been, that were active in the country uh, prior, several uh, decades prior to its formation in 1971 to those that arrived post 1971 and what you know, differentiates uh, their transnational character, capital accumulation, um, and the, the concepts that I utilized uh, were you know, merchant networks, locality, and subnational identity, which I will uh, delve further later in the conference. That's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Sana, for your paper. I now request Shikha Dilavri to present her work. Hi, great, thanks so much. I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen um, as well. Does that work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so great, thanks. Uh, yeah, first of all, thanks so much to the organizers for putting together this trans boundary time zone disciplinary feat. Um, and thanks too to the discussants and my co-panelists whose work I really enjoyed engaging with. Um, since some of you have watched the video presentation already, I'll try to be quite brief. Um, this covers an early work in progress paper that explores some of the themes of my PhD, which is broadly situated in the fields of international relations. Um, and part of which takes as a starting point contemporary contestations around caste in the Indian diaspora to help tell the story, history of the present by tracing the material and ideational connections, contradictions, and translations between race, caste, and capital through mobilities in and out of particular East Africa and the UK. Um, so my present I are itineraries of Nanji Kalidas Mehta. Born in uh, Gujarat in 1888, the merchant turned prominent industrialist and philanthropist traversed and established commercial ventures in the Western um, Indian Ocean region during the first half of the 20th century. And I follow Mitha's iterant itineraries through the English translation um, of his biography, A Dream Half Expressed, published in 1966, and which is the only autobiographical account covering Indian trade and commerce in East Africa during this period. So I suggest in the presentation that Mehta, who following Rita Burla, I read as a variant of the vernacular capitalist, can help show connections, contradictions, and translations between race, caste, and capital by offering glimpses into the chaotic processes of formal subsumption of that which preceded it into the colonially inscribed spread and sedimentation of capitalism in the Indian Ocean region. And relevant to some of the discussions we've had at the conference already, um, I suggest that following the historical 
trajectories of global capitalism from the vantage point of the vernacular capitalist can help us stretch beyond the spatial and temporal impasses which contribute to a reading of racial capitalism as a largely Atlantic phenomenon and of caste as a subcontinent bounded feudal residue. Um, together kind of contributing to efforts to deprovincialize racial capitalism as well as caste. Um, so the presentation itself is made up of three short parts. Um, so in the first part, I offer some notes on method. Um, so while I'm attentive to the arcs and resonances of the story made that tells, I offer a more materialist reading of his account, um, which kind of brings into context historical developments and events omitted and obscured. And in this way, I move in a slightly different direction from existing really illuminating work um, that, uh, that draws on Mathis autobiography, including the work of Gorg Desai. So adapting from Adam Gedichu and informed by accounts which underscore the active role of Indian merchants in shaping infrastructures and outcomes of empire and colonialism in the Western Indian Ocean. I read Mehta as engaged in a project of world making within empire, an analytic which I suggest captures the imaginative but also the material and agential aspects of his visions and practices in the context of British imperial expansion. In the second part and the lengthiest part of the presentation, I follow key moments and dynamics that shape Mehta's many trips across the Indian Ocean and his accrual of symbolic and material capital along the way underscoring how this complicates post-colonial binaries and spatial boundaries. Uh, while framed as a product of his innate caste or jathi tethered commercial acumen, the structural conditions shaping mythos transition from Cook in Madagascar in 1901 to proprietor of ventures spanning cotton, sugar, tea, and cement in East Africa, in particular in Uganda, um, and India are informed by caste and kinship networks as well as colonial infrastructures, working both in tandem and in tension. His commercial success in cotton ginning is entangled with developments in the Atlantic Ocean world. His network connections with Indians in Indian capitalists avails him with industrial know-how from Madagascar to Japan. And his industrial achievements in East Africa's racially stratified political economy facilitate this commercial and philanthropic ventures in India, availing him an audience with the Indian nationalist elite. And through these boundary troubling itineraries, I suggest that we can see some of the graded and entangled workings of race, caste, and capital. For example, this can be seen through Mitha's common refrains to unity, which inform his world, um, which, in, which informs his world making, uh, which upholds uh, notions of hierarchical differentiation between capital and labor and across race and caste. Apparent, for example, in a celebration of sugar plantations, including his own, as idealized sites of racial and religious harmony his advancement and deployment of a caste-based division of labor and laborers, and his notions of uplift within hierarchy and merit, which undergird philanthropic of cultural synthesis. And then in the very final part um, of the presentation, I draw on this account of myth as world making with an empire to return to the question of what can be gleaned about the relationship between race, caste, and capital. And I offer a few very kind of prelim preliminary thoughts. Um, I suggest that Mehta's internationalism operates in a distinct register from the at times romanticized Afro-Asian bend on solidarities, but similarly isn't simply a case of colonial mimicry. Um, I draw on the work of Ulash Inja, um, who uh, looks at racial capitalism in, in Asia, and I argue that while Mehta's outlook often aligned with notions of civilizational superiority predicated on forms of differentiation and incorporation informed by colonially inflected racial hierarchies, it also challenged and exceeded those gradations drawing attention to the ongoing operation of local and regional hierarchies within colonial capitalism and complicating any notion of a homogenous Indian. Um, and I conclude the presentation by suggesting that to adequately capture what Cedric Robertson calls the coincidence of different relations of power colliding, um, it's imperative to deprovincialize both racial capitalism and caste, an analytical move which I suggest can also let insight into what Abir Khan refers to as a differentiated and disparate materiality of the, the diaspora, and in turn can lend insight into contemporary political developments, including contestations around caste insights beyond the subcontinent. Great, thank you. Thank you, Shika, for your paper. We will now have the comments from our faculty discussants. I now request Professor Karkinchuk to provide his comments on the papers. Yeah, thank you, Swaga. So I just, just do it one by one, right? Uh, first yeah, start with so you can, paper. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then they, you can give them time to respond and then the next paper. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Alice Lin, for this uh, fascinating paper. 
actually we have been knowing each other for such a long time and it's always so nice to see you here and there and yeah i'm a long time follower of dr lin's work and yeah she offers fa fascinating ethnographic materials collected in pakistan afghanistan thailand and their global connections in transnational gemstone trade and yeah one of the rising start in the anthropology of globalizations and anthropology of South Asia. So yeah, I highly encourage all of you to learn more from her work. And this paper is, yeah, is fascinating as well. And the, the paper, yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Ellison paper has presented a, a very interesting stories about uh, the rise of um, Charter Puri, uh, a borderland towns uh, in Thailand, Cambodia border. Um, and the reason why this small place, if I, if I may put it in this way, has become a very important trading hub um, to attract a large number of uh, gemstone traders from Pakistan. Yeah, it's the key uh, findings that uh, Dr. Alice Lin's paper has offered. It. Yeah, um, so yeah, when you, know, when you read, her, read her paper, yeah, it is an ethnography or more specifically a transnational ethnography that have mapped out uh, the economic geographies of gemstone trade uh, food locating the trading hubs, the trading loops of the gemstone supply chain uh, in South Asia as well as uh, Southeast Asia. One of the key arguments um, is that uh, such the emergence uh, of this small trading town, uh, Charter Puri, is not uh, in uh, Dr. Alice Lin work, um, a default effect, uh, quote unquote, of a globalized trade. Instead, it has much to do with the uh, changing political economies of uh, colonial histories, extractive capitalisms, and transnational mobility in transnational Asia. So the strength and the power of this paper is that it has, um, it ha it has been uh, trying to capture the very long uh, trans-historical forces that have shaped it the contemporary economy of this uh, trading town, uh, Charter Puri in Thailand. Yeah, so it has to deal with some uh, very long and trans-historical uh, uh, forces at work that have shaped um, the emergency of this trading town. But yeah, as an anthropologist, I think I also wonder if there is some smaller, uh, near the present, more contemporary, also structural factor, but they work at a more on a more micro level or more specifically or uh, at a local state level. They have also played a role to, um, to contribute to the rise of Charter Puri uh, as a global trading town in transnational um, gemstone trade. Because I think maybe one of the examples that we can draw here to, uh, to inspire more conversation is uh, Dubai. <laughs> yeah, Dubai, as we all know, uh, has become an international trading hub. Um, it is also not like by default, right? Because it has like a strong uh, state factor behind at play. Yeah, when uh, when Dubai become like an international trading city, yeah, it was the time the Dubai state wanted to diversify uh, the local and the international economy uh, in the local society. So yeah, a lot of uh, strong state level interventions at play that have created quite uh, important implications for the ways in which how Dubai become Dubai as an international trading hub today. So I think maybe, uh, I think we uh, as ethnographer that we always pay details to the local specificity. I think I would like to push uh, the, uh, Dr. Alice Lin to think more about uh, maybe the local uh, local roles of the uh, governments or policymakers at a local level or other players on a local level that have also play a role to contribute to the uh, rapid development of the um, local gemstone trade economy in this small part in this small in this, in this part of Thailand. Um, if the if the local state hasn't played any role in it, I think maybe it's the, precisely the question to ask: Is it because that the local state is not quite there strongly as a person, uh, as a kind of institutionalizing force? So that's why the market has become so vibrant and so well developed uh, from below. So yeah, I think maybe uh, my kind of like questions or comment is maybe it is uh, important for us to also look at some smaller local level, but uh, shaping factor that have also played a role to kind of um, create uh, uh, structural conditions for a child, uh, for this small town to become like a global uh, trading hub. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much.
Dr. Alice Lin, if you'd like, you can respond to Dr. Chuk's comments. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chuk. Uh, please, please just call me uh, Bing. <laughs> no need for Dr. Allison. Um, uh, so yeah, thank you for thank you for such uh, generous comments. And um, this is an aspect that I'm afraid is apparently lacking in, in my empirical, uh, in my material right now. And it's certainly something I look forward to. I will dig further as when I return, I plan to go back to the field. Um, yeah, this understanding of local sort of state level uh, um, uh, initiatives that that make Chantaburi into this sort of marketplace. Um, and from what I've what I've known um, so far, uh, these different gem trading uh, districts, whether it's in Bangkok or Chantaburi, uh, they're known as cluster markets um, in in sort of the local um, uh, market speak. Um, and there are places that I don't really know what sort of initiatives went into constructing it, but these are places that are, I think, um, formed by both both a sort of state, the state, but as well as the merchants themselves. So many of the open shops that you see, uh, that's in my paper and that you see in my slide, these open shops are in fact rented by um, uh, foreigners or locals uh, in order to sort of facilitate a, a trading space. Um, so in that sense, um, many of these criteria that they've come up with, such as um, facilitating the buying and selling, taking of commission from, from the, the seller, and then giving back of commission to the buyer, all of this is contingent on each and every you know, individual uh, shop owner themselves. So, um, and I'm, I'm not actually entirely sure if, if these are state mandated uh, sort of trading rules. Um, so that could be something that we should really look into. Um, as for whether, yeah, so paying attention to local specificity, uh, I, I, I suppose I, I really was, I, I guess I got sidetracked by the sort of historical contingency that led to um, sort of Chantaburi's place, right, in at the, at the borders between Cambodia and 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 uh, Thailand that made that made it into a, um, a sort of like key node in the gem trade, and I, I sort of failed to see um, sort of the more contemporary uh, factors that go into uh, propping this market up, right? Um, aside from the fact that the uh, sort of proliferation of factories. Um, for cutting and 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 sort of heat treatments um, are are highly concentrated in the city. So yeah, that's something I, I should really look into. Um, sort of the re the reason, the origin of why the this place and and not other places. It's sort of a peripheral place if you think about it, as compared to Bangkok, right? Bangkok is the big, is the capital. It's also uh, it also has a very vibrant gem trading scene. It has the 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 national jewelry trading center. So um, yeah, so these are really, uh, really generative and productive suggestions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Bing. Um, if you don't have further comments, Professor Chuk, we can move on to co your comments on Sana's paper. Okay, yeah, just a second. Yeah, Sana, uh, nice to meet you for the very first time. And yeah, because you know that I just have introduced my research. I work on Indian traders in China and most of them are Sindhi traders. So, and, and many of them have very close business connections between their business operations based in China and their business associates based in Dubai. So it is so nice to have a conversations with you here that we can, uh, I can, I, that I can learn more from your work in Dubai. And yeah, um, maybe I just kind of start by uh, summarizing uh, um, um, Sana's paper. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting word uh, which uh, tell us the kind of untold story of the rise and fall of some of the most powerful, some of the most uh, influential Indian business like communities uh, figures in Dubai. Yeah, um, the, the paper is based on very detailed archival and historical research on several case studies of large scale Indian businesses in Dubai. 
China has done a great job in uh, just uh, just uh, just as posings the story of several Indian um, individual with the larger and, and with the larger more structural conditions that have enabled it, uh, their business expansions. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the state patronage um, given by the Dubai's rulers and the long-standing transnational uh, family and, and, and kinship network that have made uh, their uh, expansional, ex expans uh, business expansions possible in Dubai. Yeah, so I consider this is a very uh, productive approach and, and I think it will be even more productive if uh, Sana can push her analysis uh, even more uh, forward on some other dimensions of uh, social political conditions, again, uh, specific <laughs> to the local society of Dubai, particularly those that have been explored by uh, other scholars who also work uh, in this region, of course, Professor Andrea White, and then Professors uh, Liha Wola, uh, who the, the authors of the book, Impossibles, uh, in, uh, Impossibles Indians. And, um, Lisa Matthew, if you know her, yeah, she also worked uh, as a historian. She also worked a lot on the criminals and uh, criminal economies in Dubai and its longer histories. And of course, Anne San Ho, who also has uh, spoken a lot about the specificities of Dubai and how it becomes such a uh, important global hub uh, with certain kinds of uh, under certain kinds of historical conditions. Yeah, so I mean, in particular, I think Lee Hawara's analysis is uh, will be will be will be very relevant to the ways in which you, how you craft your analysis. Yeah, Liha Rola, if you, uh, I think she is also one of the discussants of our conference, right? And yeah, it is always nice to learn more from her work and very important work on the Indian communities in Dubai. Yeah, uh, Liha Rola's studies of Indians in Dubai has shown that um, the Indians, um, no, uh, Dubai's exceptionality uh, in her work uh, on several frontiers, uh, such as um, the impossibility for the Indians to obtain uh, Dubai citizenship. And uh, more crucially, its uh, unique status as both an international trading hub and uh, in her work, a rugged lawless frontiers. Yeah, these are some of the key uh, institutional factors that have consolidated uh, the formations of Indian diasporic communities in Dubai um, uh, against all the precarity odds. Um, so that, that is basically her uh, kind of like core argument uh, as I found out from her book. So, I mean, in that, I mean, drawing on the insights from Liha Roller's uh, analysis as such, uh, which treat Dubai as kind of like a whole, not necessarily only focusing on the Indians themselves, but she also kind of like um, trying to draw the connections between the larger structural conditions and is implications for the existence of the Indian communities uh, on, the, on the ground level. So, I mean, uh, when I compare your work with hers, I, I was wondering if exceptionality uh, in an institutional sense and informality of Dubai as becoming a place uh, like that, uh, international trading hub, but with a lot of flexibility for people to uh, manipulate in uh, what, what you call as a kind of like lawless or maybe quasi formal, uh, quasi formal or quasi legal economy. So, is there any role for this kind of larger factor to play? Yeah, because uh, Lee rural analysis is mostly based, uh, focusing on the middle class Indians like populations. But in your case, it's like more a uh, billion layer, the most powerful figures. But this kind of like informalities and exceptionality, I mean, as a kind of like a very clear conceptual uh, kind of tools that many scholars have used to analyze the case of Indians in Dubai. Does it also apply in your case studies? Yeah, that would be uh, something that I really want to know uh, from your work. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Um, yes, okay. Uh, Let's start with the socio-political angle that you mentioned. Uh, yes, that is pretty much at the heart, you know, to study the, also to study the political evolution of the UAE since 1971. And uh, what, uh, I mean, besides the fact that I have lived all my life in the UAE, but also the fact that uh, the reason that I chose UAE as a case study is because it is turning out to be a center of Indian capitalists. Uh, the, the oldest Indian merchant community in the region continues uh, uh, to reside in Muscat. 
in Oman, but majority of them have been naturalized as Omani citizens. So they still don't, uh, uh, you know, you, I cannot, uh, you know, compare them with the uh, merchant diaspora here because they are, uh, they, uh, they are pretty much Omani naturalized citizens. Uh, and uh, the, the political um, uh, aspect is quite important in the sense that despite, I mentioned in the presentation that despite the announcements of several long-term residencies and even citizenship, uh, there are no guarantees uh, of what it means or how it translates uh, to the security of their um, businesses or their freedoms. Uh, and I, uh, you know, also use the example of pandemic of how it brought forth uh, the uh, idea that, uh, you know, of, of what Andrew Gardner uh, mentioned in his study of the Indian community in Bahrain, that the ethnocratic underpinnings of the state defy class logic. So, you know, uh, uh, they uh, they might be ha they are multi billionaire businessmen who, uh, uh, you know, who have businesses listed in the London Stock Exchange and like I'm, I mean no more now, <laughs> but uh, then uh, that surely does not translate uh, to their businesses being secure or uh, you know them having any political outreach. Uh, in, in the country. Uh, uh, so uh, yes, I, I in terms of, uh, uh, yes, Neha Vora's Impossible Citizens was, uh, uh, was, I could say, the closest that came to studying uh, the business community uh, in Dubai. And then she, and she focuses on the, uh, the, the pre-1971 uh, generation that really informed my thesis. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, the reason I felt that there has to be a follow-up because in the past decade and a half, uh, we have seen the rise of these tycoons, basically, who came as professional migrants. So they are not from the traditional business community, but are professional migrants who came and then, uh, uh, you know, set out to diversify uh, the Indian community presence, which was very much focused on the the trade, uh, gold, and retail to you know sectors such as education, healthcare. And uh, uh, yes, the uh, domestic politics is also quite central, especially as UAE uh, is uh, a pretty much uh, a wanting, uh, it's quite becoming quite aggressive geopolitically in the region. And uh, we are also seeing how these uh, uh, businessmen are, uh, uh, are, are not, uh, are, are pretty much uh, uh, becoming like proxies. Uh, uh, and, and you know an instrumental uh, i mean an instrument uh, for investment for the regime in the capital abu dhabi uh, to you know uh, expand uh, abu dhabi's ambitions in egypt or saudi arabia uh, and even israel so uh, uh, yes i mean i think the the the, uh, uh, the the next direction or the next level of this research will uh, definitely focus on the uh, you know the, the the role that the community plays in regime stabilization because the same argument cannot be applied uh, to the historic uh, merchant community in muscat because most of them have been naturalized citizens yeah i think that's about it Um, Professor Chick, if, if you have comments, further comments on Sana's paper, or or if not, yeah. we can move on to Shika's paper. Yeah, I think that's very uh, very very engaged response. Yeah, but in any in any sense, I'm very looking forward to yeah to, to the final product of your research. Yeah, which hopefully will be a very good publications. Yeah, so we can move on to uh, Shika's paper, uh, your comments on Shika's paper. Yeah, hi, nice to see you, <laughs> Shika. And yeah, thank you so much for writing such a uh, wonderful paper that uh, frankly, I I have very little knowledge about, but because your writing is very clear. So yeah, it is a very good lesson for me to learn the, uh, the, the legacy of this very uh, interesting figure, uh, Laji Kalada's um, matter, yeah. So again, I will just uh, sort of uh, try my best to summarize uh, Shaker's papers, like key arguments, and then, and then afterwards, I will try to also give some response to it. So Shaker's papers have uh, has produced um, what I would consider a very critical appraisal of uh, the Gujarati's uh, industrialists, 
uh, Largely Canada's matter. Yeah, which was, who was very active uh, in Afro-Asian trade connections over a long period of time. Uh, by drawing on uh, very critical readings of Martha's autobiography and his uh, long time transnational journeys uh, across uh, the Indian Ocean, South Asia and other related regions. Yeah, Shikas has made a very strong argument that um, Martha's legacies uh, should not be simply understood as uh, decolonial and anti-capitalism. Rather, um, his uh, such appearance um, um, positionality or, or imaginations is actually uh, largely an outcome of entanglement at best, uh, exploitations at worst, uh, of uh, structural power inequality uh, between race, caste, labor, and capital. Yeah, she can uh, thereby uh, makes a very compelling argument that uh, matters uh, legacy can also be understood as part of the global racial capitalism, which, uh, um, which, may, uh, which we may tend to think it just happened across the Atlantic, but actually it basically happens also in this particular case of uh, Africa and South Asia, of course, including Indian oceans. So I think it's a very strong and, 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 and well-crafted argument. And it seems to me that it implies the material legacies uh, of uh, matters, thoughts, and philosophies uh, in the contemporary Indian politics, which at first, uh, it appeared quite anti-colonial and decolonial, but in fact, it is feeding uh, more to the hyper-nationalist settlements or what she call as a Hindu hegemonic settlements. Uh, which become very strong mobilizing force uh, to justify uh, the uh, ongoing and sustained existences of uh, caste hierarchy and power injustice uh, in the Indian society. So in this sense, I think uh, Sh uh, Shikas has uh, articulated a very strong and powerful critique uh, to matters, force, and philosophies uh, on his uh, hi uh, hyper-nationalizing or in my own word, uh, ideological license uh, effects and outcome. And it has been uh, quite thoughtfully and uh, fruitfully shown uh, and elaborated in her paper, if you read it very carefully. But uh, also on this, uh, on this point, I am kind of wondering um, to what extent can we also uh, make such analysis uh, move beyond the level of a uh, hyper-nationalist uh, ideological so yeah, uh, so I think the critique to the ideological formation is pretty clear, but because when we are talking about uh, racial capitalism, it is also has a very strong uh, dimensions on its um, materiality. And I think what I mean here is that uh, can we also uh, gather and collect more material evidence, no matter that is from the archives or other kinds of venues to show that uh, the uh, matters, force, and philosophies has actually uh, been leading to some actually existing uh, racial capitalism or racial injustice uh, in local and in the, uh, global Indian society. Uh, when we consider to analyze a topic like uh, racial capitalism, I think it's quite necessary. I think it's quite necessary to so um, um, the evidence of open and violent violence, uh, the systematic or machine night uh, rule by the white, and yeah, dispossessions and structural uh, exploitations by peoples uh, by 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 colors or other kinds of like existing social and cultural marker, and so on. So maybe I maybe just force ourselves to think in an other way, uh, from another angle. Is this such a, is there is such a, it, I mean, do we really have a type of capitalism that could be free from uh, racializations of human differences? Yeah, perhaps it may be um, some, the life of inquiry that uh, I try to pose here, not necessarily that we can find an answer, but I think it would be quite productive that we can, sort of gather and collect more uh, material evidence uh, to show that it is not just about ideology. It, just not, it is not just about ideological but it is also about 
uh, uh, how people think about uh, matter legacies in contemporary uh, global Indian politics. Yeah, so that is some uh, thing I would like to offer here. Hopefully that will be helpful for our discussions. Thank you so much. Yeah, those are extremely helpful. And I'm sorry, um, there might be a cat that might attack me on my lap, which you might have seen jump on my lap earlier. Um, yeah, no, thank you for those really um, helpful comments. I have to admit, I was a bit nervous being an IR scholar whose field is kind of famous for abstraction and being in a room with a bunch of anthropologists. Um, but um, yeah, no, I, I actually appreciated too the summary of the paper um, because I think it's really interesting to see how it's kind of interpolated from, from someone else's um, from someone else's eyes, and I really appreciated that you pulled out um, the importance of kind of complicating a simple anti-colonial or post-colonial kind of rendering of a, a figure that might often be seen through the lens of the subaltern, um, which I'm kind of inverting to be seen through the lens of the vernacular capitalist, um, because that's one of the interventions in the wider thesis that I kind of want to make is we need to we need to think about um, the relationship between anti-caste critique and post-colonial theory. Um, and also the what what kind of avails post-colonial theory and decolonial theory in the contemporary context to be kind of appropriated by the Hindu right um, in all sorts of ways. Um, is there something kind of foundational to the levels of critique within post-colonial theory then that, that end up kind of availing it to that kind of um, reappropriation? Um, in terms of the questions themselves, so the one on materiality, yeah. Um, this is definitely the direction where I want to be moving um, in this paper. So as I kind of alluded to in the five minute presentation that I touch upon in the paper too, um, there are a couple of um, there are a couple of scholars who have engaged with Mitha's uh, biography, autobiography in really fruitful ways um, that have really informed my kind of approach to it. But one of the limitations I found is that they kind of do get stuck in the in the realm of the ideological or the imaginative. And I think there is this imperative to kind of move to the material um, and to think about, you know, not only Mitha's vision, but also his practices and not exclusively his practices, but how we can kind of stretch those into the contemporary moment too. Um, to think about, for instance, forms of extractivism within the global south between India and East Africa. Um, so for instance, Mitha's own conglomerate, conglomerate today um, has been accused of um, more contemporary forms of land grabbing. And in 2007, it led to kind of massive protests uh, that manifested in anti-Indian violence in Uganda. So I do definitely want to bring those um, threads out a little bit. Um, and I think the difficulty that I've had with that, and I'd be open to kind of suggestions, is thinking about, I think working with biography, which is something slightly new to me, um, poses some challenges just in terms of this idea of grafting micro-historical and macro-historical kind of detail together. Um, and also, despite the fact that Mitha is this kind of um, prominent industrialist and philanthropist, he's also, you know, not a prominent figure in the archive. So towards the end of the longer paper, I put him in conversation with S.K. Patel, who is a prominent figure in the Indian National Congress around the same time. And I kind of put them into conversation with each other um, in order to point to the fact that, you know, while they do have similar views in terms of um, how they how they kind of um, present their forms of internationalism. While S.K. Patel is, you know, this prominent figure, Metha is still kind of like a footnote uh, in the archive. Um, so I think that the trouble I've been having is kind of trying to trying to sit with Metha, but then also to bring in um, all these kind of other material factors. But I do think for me, the kind of next step is to is to both look at the archive, but then to look at the work of others who've worked on um, Uganda's political economy, like. Mamdani um, and some others who have worked specifically on um, the sugar industry in Uganda to maybe point to some of those material uh, dynamics um, and kind of elaborate on a few that I touch upon in the paper, for instance, Metha's response to labor agitations, um, which, you know, there's just like glimmers of that. Um, yeah, and then in terms of the the question about whether there's it's possible for there to be capitalism free from forms of racialization. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the question that's kind of, I think from the vantage point of, of someone like Cedric Robinson, it would probably be, be a pretty straight no there. Um, and so I, I, I tend to find that argument quite compelling. Um, and part of what kind of pushes me towards this direction of research is to kind of think about okay, well, what are the various forms of racialization then that operate if we if we 
kind of take as a given that racialization is central to forms of capitalism. There's not st strictly one form of racialization that's in operation. And there was a really amazing special issue um, put out recently about thinking racialization in India. And I think um, how I see my work is kind of contributing to those types of conversations. Um, yeah, I think that's all. That's very helpful and thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Chuck, for your really insightful comments. I now request uh, Professor Wright uh, to provide her comments on Bing's paper. Thank you. So, um, well, I just want to say, first off, thank you so much for this um, paper. I really learned a lot and I am fascinated by the various ways in which um, people move in unexpected ways that we wouldn't necessarily anticipate. Um, and so I don't want to, I had a I don't want to repeat Dr. Shoup, but I want to just highlight some of the strengths that I saw in the paper and um, including just the fascinating research site itself and this how the history of colonial genome extraction in the area um, relates to its current place as a central node in the supply chain. So um, the gem market is not simply, you say, like, doesn't simply come into being, but is partially a result of this resource appropriation historically. Um, and I also found your points around the multi-mobility of markets in extractive industries to be um, really important. Um, as it was the need to make sense of the shifts or think about supply chains, not only in spatial terms, but also in longer temporal terms, um, thereby providing important clues on how to theorize global processes. Um, and this is, of course, very rich ethnographically in both the paper and the presentation. And I was particularly interested in by the concepts of value, trust, and credit that emerged in your paper. Um, and I thought those came up in these, you know, wonderfully rich details that you have, including this um, inverted market that you discussed, as well as um, the value that is added at the site through like gem polishing and things, if I understand correctly, there's a production of expertise. Um, and so what I saw is really particularly fascinating was that there were multiple forms of it seemed businessmen or traders who were structuring this like global supply chain of um, gems through creating a standardization in the marketplace, right? Like, and through, um, and that helped facilitate trades and markets. And then um, I guess one of the questions though that emerges is how could we not only have like a longer um, uh, temporal, I guess, how, how do we extend not only the temporality, but also spatiality? So um, I think that there's some profit that's being created through difference in the supply chain. And I guess, in, um, and maybe my question is thinking about how do we include Africa, where you said much, many of the gems are being um, mined now, how do we include that into our discussion of the, um, of your discussion? Like, so, you know, it, um, and I, I guess I'm thinking about the logics of who moves where and who's able to move where, um, both due to like the powers of bound, state boundaries or the powers of visas, but also these unexpected moves that you tell us. Um, I'm interested, I'd love to know more about the intermediaries and their expertise because this seems so central. And it seems to me as though maybe that's one of those linking um, points between this like longer colonial history and the present moment was this development of expertise or um, skill sets in the area. Um, but as I was thinking about expertise, I began to wonder like what, how, what is the value of the stones that are being talked about? And does that value differ for different participants in the supply chain? And I guess I'm thinking about it beyond a financial value, but one of the ways you talked about um, the markets was you had like discussed deceit. And I was curious if that was like a useful analytic strategy or is it, are there frictions that are produced through different values? Um, and then I had some smaller questions like, how do the sellers acquire the gemstones? Who are the sellers? Um, what languages are being spoken in the market and who's translating? Um, and then I guess my last question has to do with um, gem markets as resource frontiers. And I began to wonder if maybe, what, if maybe they're become more central, I, I guess, and maybe there is, would the frontier be Africa or like what's the value of thinking of it? Or what's the, um, what do we learn by thinking about those markets as a frontier, you know, and um, as opposed to like a central node, maybe in another analysis, but thank you. It was a really fascinating work. Um, 
Thank you so much. Uh, oh, wow. So, so, so much to think through. Um, so on the, I'll, I'll just begin with maybe the uh, thinking about value, trust, and credit. Um, so I, I, I think I'll begin by talking about why I sort of was brought to Chantabui in the first place. And it was because um, the market where I was based in Peshawar uh, is known for a lack of standardization uh, in, 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 in Northwest Pakistan. So I, I was based mostly there and there's this sort of vibrant uh, mineral and gem trading scene that emerged um, in the late um, 1960s, uh, which kind of coincided with uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and uh, the coming of, of, of sort of refugees from Afghanistan who had the specific, you know, skill set and access um, to mines in Afghanistan. So most of the minerals and gems that were brought to Pakistan were in fact from Afghanistan. And so these are the, and these are the same sort of actors who then having, you know, made enough capital decided to then pursue their livelihoods in, in, in Thailand. Uh, and so these are the people that I uh, basically follow to Chantaburi. And, and, and so it's interesting to see that how um, Chantaburi, I think a lot of them will say that it's not really standardized, but that it is, it is a constant negotiation process, but that in some ways, because of the this, this sort of mechanism they have um, set up in, in Chantaburi, they a lot of the dealers feel that they are able to um, sort of trade in more standardized terms, even if value is not standardized. So, so how much how much they would pay for a parcel, a lot of of agates or rubies uh, would depend on the quality, and you know this is a discussion between them and the the middle the middleman, and the middleman um, the middle person uh, in 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 this in Chantaburi marketplace are usually locals, so Thai Thai nationals, um, and not not specifically from Chantaburi is was was my um, sense, and they are usually working for. Um, either like a, a much wealthier sort of person for uh, who owns sort of these gems or owns the factory that cuts uh, these gems. And so they are basically hawkers who work for, for these individuals. Um, so there's many sort of layers of different actors within this marketplace, which is really interesting. And it's hard to sort of flesh out in this short paper, but I, I think it's certainly something I will, I will look into doing. And then, then I can really, um, you know, tie these ideas of uh, like trust uh, between, you know, with the hawkers and the individuals and then the trust between also uh, shop owners and buyers uh, to, so the multi-layered, uh, you know, the nationals and peoples. Um, and this question of how do I extend it, uh, oh, sorry, how, how do I include Africa in this discussion? So I, I was really thinking about, um, something that Shika, was it Shika who said, um, sort of like e extraction in South-South contexts. Um, and, and this is certainly something I see um, happening here because um, North American dealers and sort of the, the, the upper, the, the, the so-called high, high quality dealers are kind of the minority there. The, the majority of the buyers we see there are mostly from India, uh, Pakistan, um, and then different parts of, uh, and, and also China, and um, and 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 African uh, dealers of minerals are they don't they're not buyers of finished gems, but rather they're suppliers of rough minerals, and so that so that creates a really interesting uh, contrast to sort of you see where um, the 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 sort of raw commodity forms are are being supplied and then who is then um, adding value to it uh, through processing, through trading, um, through all this extra stages of, um, you know, processing in some ways. Um, so yeah, so I, I it's, 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 uh, thank you for bringing it up. I, I, I would like to be able to incorporate um, the, the role of um, sort of, raw commodity dealers at, and, and who are who are mostly East Africans in in the story um, and and yeah and then that brings me to thinking about sort of the frictions also um, so there is there, when I was in the market uh, there, there was a lot of sort of arguments about who was losing out and who was 
making the most profit. And, and some would say that it is the shop owners who have who are not actually engaging in the trade who are actually making more money than the dealers themselves. Uh, and then, of, of course, the, 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 um, the dealers who are from Africa who I interviewed are also very well aware that they are they have the shorter end of the stick because they they are the ones supplying large uh, amounts of you know rough minerals and those minerals are then sold in tiny in in, in carrots right in 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 per, uh, per mil, uh, gram right so um so yeah these are all like very um sort of complex and uh hierarchical um interactions that i i'm trying to also untangle in my in my paper um, so yeah, so lots of things to to think about in the in the in the longer rendition of my paper, and uh, to your question about what languages are spoken, and uh, so so in the in the marketplace, it's uh, there's a, always a calculator on the table, and people speak through the calculator, but the but most of most of my 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 interlocutors have actually mastered um, spe speaking in Thai for especially haggling, so they they they're able to say very simple sort of numbers and and um, just say that's too expensive or uh, how much is that and things. So so over there, it's, it's really interesting. I speak in uh, Pashto with uh, my interlocutors, but then they speak in Thai uh, with with uh, the local uh, hawkers. Um, so, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a it's a really it's, it's a truly um, multi sort of <laughs> lingual space to be in. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Wright. It's really helpful. Thank you. It's it's really fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading more of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Bing, and thank you, Professor Wright. We can move on to um, Sana's paper. So thank you so much, Sana, for this um, really engaging and evocative discussion of trade networks um, between um, and Indian merchants in particular in the United Arab Emirates. And I was just absolutely fascinated by your um, discussion of like, India, Japan, and the Gulf, and the influence of the electronics trade. So I guess I'm really interested in these like unexpected routes that people, um, things might take through all the papers. Um, and I was also interested in your um, work, I guess, thinking about pre and post 1971, um, and how you, you argue that uh, pre 1971 merchants are maybe less prone to boom and bust because, um, and you talk about the importance of kinship for that, but also the size of the um, companies. Um, hi. Um, so, I, so I was impressed with this, like these like larger discussions of like electronics sending and thinking about 1971 as a change in size of companies. Um, I also thought your work- Sorry, Professor Wright, I got uh, bumped off for a minute. Oh. I don't know why. <laughs> so could, could you oh, just it's fine. I, um, <laughs> well, I was like yeah. saying, thank you for this really engaging um, and yeah, really sure. provocative paper. And I, um, you know, I really, I really enjoyed your discussion of um, like electronics markets in the UAE as well as, uh, and, you know, why we would see that as well as, um, I was interested in your um, your contrast between pre and post 1971 as like a, um, both business structures and like, but also bringing in kinship into that discussion I thought was really fantastic. Um, I also appreciated how you think about COVID as a moment that is not necessarily like just about cause and effect, but also how it demonstrates some vulnerability that emerges. Um, and, you know, thinking about particularly for Shetty with the um, NMC Health and his current um, uh, legal issues, right? And so, um, and I like that the care you take not to attribute it necessarily just to COVID, but revealing how, like, but using COVID to reveal how there's an uncertainty or, um, even for the very, the wealthiest um, people. But um, I guess, and I don't wanna, again, repeat uh, questions that have come up, although I, um, but I wanted to, I so I'll try to ask some questions that are a little bit different, but how, one of the questions I had was about this historic choice of 1971. Um, and I, I guess I'm wondering if you would see different um, themes if you chose a different like um, timeline. So, cause I think that we see um, particularly like the development of laws that structure who can own business, like both business owning as well as like land owning um, being developed pre 1971, right? And so how those, you know, if we would see a different story if we um, move the timeline a little bit. 
Um, I'm also interested in um, if you could say a little bit more about um, if the Indian state provides any assistance, especially for the very wealthy. And I'm also interested in maybe just pushing the um, Andrew Gardner's idea about um, like ethnicity, you know, being more important than class, especially um, when we look at like the differences. I mean, I think that there, there are though, diff even, well, um, even the very wealthy, are, there is a vulnerability. Um, I think one of the benefits I see from uh, like Nay how Vora's work in Possible Citizens, and I know that came up already, but one of the benefits I see is she's actually talking about how middle and upper class Indians are like actually help reproduce the state in some ways and are actually like working as um, like, so it's, there's, um, especially because of um, how uh, the visa systems work and things, right? And so there, it's not, I think that there is um, some differences within Indian nationals. And I guess I would like, I would love to hear any thoughts you have on that. Um, and I guess one of the ways I thought maybe that would emerge is thinking about how um, court cases play out in the United Arab Emirates, even like I, so in my work, I know I don't work with, um, I work more with um, middle-class um, individuals who like are partially own uh, factories and things, but they, I know there there's court cases that often are decided in their favor in like even with, against Emiratis. Um, but like the ability to even bring a court case seems to me as though that's like a class space there. Like, so class there plays a role because it's very hard for a laborer to, you know, bring a court case in, um, against their employer. And so I was wondering if you had, um, if you think that, I, I know that like there's the issues of like citizenship and what rights are being extended in, like our permanence is allowed in some ways, but I was wondering maybe even through the analysis of like um, thinking about Shetty, like how um, maybe class also does play a role, I, I guess, or if you think it's um, not worth thinking about, I would love to hear more. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Professor Wright, for those comments. Um, so, okay, so let's uh, start with your first point, I think, on Indian state. Yes, in my thesis, in fact, I, I make the argument that uh, when it comes to facilitating uh, government to government relations, surprisingly, uh, you know, uh, the Indian Muslim community has a not much of a very, uh, 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 you know, powerful or influential role. I mean, that has definitely changed after the arrival of Modi uh, and his uh, debut uh, trip to the UAE, sort of, and his uh, uh, backdoor meetings with many of uh, these uh, tycoons, uh, uh, sort of reinstates. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, challenges that argument of, uh, 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 you know, I mean, uh, how they are powerful intermediaries. Uh, but then again, uh, th those meetings were very much about getting investments back home in India. And it had not much to do with, uh, you know, government, uh, you know, strengthening government to government ties. And, uh, and it won't really matter because, I mean, uh, like I said uh, uh, in the presentation, the, the ties, I mean, the historic ties between India and the crucial states and the uh, Persian Gulf at large are, you know, do not really require the presence of these tycoons or, you know, to uh, strengthen it or to take it to a different level. Um, uh, so, and in terms of, uh, you know, so when we talk about Shetty, who was a former functionary of the BJP party, even prior to coming, uh, to the UAE and uh, well he continues to remain in exile so we see the Indian state is also kind of muted and um, not really uh, uh, you know acting I don't know what's happening behind the scenes but then again he is not in a very uh, strong position Shetty and he continues to remain in exile and uh, it it's it's still uh, it's still, still not clear why wouldn't he you know Find the case here. Although it's happening internationally, the courts are being, the court cases are being, uh, the, the legal battles are being fought in the US and the UK. He can very much continue staying here, but we just do not know why he refuses to come back. So, uh, or what he, he was, I think, asked to basically go overnight in exile and he hasn't been back as yet. So, um, uh, again, um, uh, yes, uh, uh, the influence of uh, this community has sort of uh, increased, I think, uh, pan India after the arrival of Modi. But whether they are uh, uh, quite influential in uh, facilitating the ties between Delhi and Abu Dhabi, uh, I don't 
I'm not of that opinion. Uh, and then uh, Andrew uh, Gardner's point, uh, yes, again, um, I, uh, I've also brought up the example of the, the second tycoon, the, uh, the CEO of the, the retail giant guru, uh, and uh, how at the pandemic, I mean, no one saw this coming, but then I, I just particularly focus on the high net worth businesses that would somehow uh, give us the impression that they are untouchables. But how at the uh, you know, height of the pandemic, we saw, I mean, he, have, has, he, has, he has built this empire over 40 years, over 40 plus years, but then at the height of the pandemic, we hear that 20% which is a substantial stake has been sold to a member of the Abu Dhabi royal family. So um, I am I breaking? Sorry. OK. You're OK. Great. Uh, has my screen frozen by any chance? It's no, you're fine. You're, it's... Yeah. you're fine. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, so uh, talking of class reproduction, uh, yes, I think that's it's, it's pretty much a simultaneous process uh, where, uh, uh, you know, I mean, going back to Nehawara's uh, discussion on how they regulate the entry and the exit, um, you know, by uh, acting like citizens. Uh, you know, the, the, there is a class element, of course. And then there's, again, a simultaneous uh, class reproduction, I feel. Uh, in terms of uh, them even, I mean, <laughs> uh, the fact that they even accept uh, of uh, being happy sort of with just long-term residencies when they have actually given their entire life uh, to this country and they are still making do with these 10-year uh, golden visas, which cannot be even compared to the green card of the USA. <laughs> and so I, I just feel that in you know, a broader scheme of things, so they are, you know, uh, uh, two things that are happening simultaneously where uh, uh, the, but between Indian expatriates, of course, there's a reproduction of class and capitalism as well as uh, between the ruling regime and uh, the, the merchant class, yeah. That's about Thank you, that's, that's fascinating. And I look forward to reading more of your work as well. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Sana. Um, we can now move on to uh, Shekhar's paper. Great. So um, thank you so much for this really excellent and timely analysis of like caste capitalism and racism. Um, uh, and I, I very much appreciated your point that caste, I'm quoting you, caste does not simply precede capitalism, but is adapted and mobilized towards the ongoing um, operation, end quote. And I just, I thought it was, um, your paper just so skillfully looks at this through this um, autobiography of Mitta. And, um, and I, I appreciate how it, it provides us new ways of destabilizing our understandings of race is often being like um, located within an Atlantic world and caste is, you know, being um, located in, in the South Asian one. Um, and I found a reflection on like uh, how this was playing out in Africa and India and how Mitta was seeing it to be really fascinating, especially this um, how you know this what you highlight the division of not only labor but of laborers and how you know this is obfuscating caste with class um within a like a uh hindu nationalist perhaps framing um but also how this like you know seems to naturalize inequalities and um move that so i um I, again i, I don't want to repeat but um one of the um things I would love to hear more about is how we can understand, like maybe more, how are race and caste in this like early 20th century informing each other? You know, I, I think that um, uh, Pervy Mehta, who's at Colorado College has some work on that. And I, I think it would be, if, if you see it either emerge in the autobiography of your other sources. Um, I have one very, like very specific question about the use of the word DNA in the text and if he actually talks about DNA or if it's um, being read into his text after the fact, because I, I think the DNA is really very fascinating because then in some ways, it seems like caste and race might be being seen as almost um, 
having some parallels, right? If they're like things that are, if jati is DNA, then um, I, I would love to know more about that. Um, and I would also, I guess I'm curious about how, and maybe this relates back to my first question, but how do we see, like, do we see understandings of caste moving out of the subcontinent? Like, are they are they moving around in Uganda where um, Meta's plantation is located, right? Um, so do we see like, outside of India, caste becoming implica implicated or implicated with discussions of race and citizenship. Um, or, yeah, and in Uganda or in other parts of the British Empire. Um, and then I had one last question about sources, because I find this the use of autobiography to, and putting it in conversation with these material aspects to just be such a wonderful methodology. Um, and I, I was really struck by your discussion of material engagements. Um, and I was wondering about like, if you could tell, and you talked about this a little bit, I think when you were answering the last, your last answer, but thinking about um, that either the challenges of working with autobiography or, you know, like what kinds of insights we get through these um, autobiographies of um, these transnational individuals in the early 19th century. So. Um, Thank you again so much. It was really very um, thought provoking and excellent. So thank you. Great, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll try to be quite brief because I'm conscious of the time, um, but just starting with um, the question around how race and caste are informing each other at this particular um, juncture. And I would love to, um, if, if it was possible to write down the name of the person that you mentioned who was doing this work, that would be great because I don't think I've come across their work before. Um, so I think there's multiple different ways to think about this question and lots of people who have who've kind of, um, both people who have looked at it in the past and I think there's like an uptake now in terms of thinking about the ways in which race and caste inform each other. Um, a lot of that work has been through kind of thinking about race and caste as analogy, but there's a lot of really interesting work that's also just looking at the ways in which um, forms of um, how notions of, of kind of race and racialization um, in like amongst the British were informed by what they observed with regards to caste um, in India. So I think like Dirks's work is kind of one of the earlier iterations of that, um, which has now been kind of deployed in all sorts of kind of bizarre ways. Um, but there's also a lot of work too emerging, um, including work by Ida Bergfad on how Aryanism is a site through which we can think about the relationship between race and caste um, in, the sub in the subcontinent um, and how we need to think about um, Aryanism as a kind of inter-elite discourse between Brahmins and, and kind of British elites. Um, so I think there's a lot of kind of fruitful ways to kind of think about those questions. Another, another um, way to think about it is kind of through the, through the realm of kind of endogamy um, so the ways in which kind of um, endogamy is it, particularly in relation to caste kind of reinforces, uh, you know, forms of, um, of like kind of caste hierarchy um, and how that might be tied up with kind of and, and distinct also from uh, forms of endogamy kind of with regards to kind of race relations in different contexts too, of course, like, you know, ideas of endogamy within the US versus like if we're going to like South America and elsewhere would be quite, quite distinct. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think there's a lot of fruitful work in that, um, in that direction. And a lot of it has informed just kind of this heuristic for me of thinking about race and caste together. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's like an area that um, I'm kind of interested in picking up more work from there, but then also bringing capital into this conversation um, a little bit more um, because, and, and labor stratification stratification specifically and I think one of the directions in terms of how I'm thinking about metha is whether we can also view through it metha kind of idea of a global division of labor in which both caste and race are kind of implicated um on the DNA point so he doesn't actually say that and now I feel like maybe I've misrepresented him but at the first chapter of his um book he actually um talks about his caste lineage and presents that as very much informing the kind of directions of his life. So throughout the book, there's kind of this tension between his desire to be a kind of ascetic and spiritual, and then on the other hand, to kind of look outwards um, and follow his kind of commercial ambition. And he, he in frequent, on frequent occasions in the book, he kind of goes back to his caste identity in order to justify why he's doing what he's doing and why it is kind of his, um, his like calling 
to be doing that particular thing. But the language of DNA, I actually, um, I, I was reading a special is issue of Samaj, which was on Indian elites, I think published in 2017. And it's really interesting because um, it talks about how this idea of connecting commercial acumen to kind of like cast DNA. So like, you know, Banyas quote unquote are inherently good at X or Y um, comes through in a lot of um, biographies of businessmen, including contemporary ones. And so what I thought was really fascinating was that Mehta, given his autobiography was kind of one of the early ones published, seems to kind of prefigure that formation. Um, and so that's kind of where that, that idea of DNA kind of comes from. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think of what the other one was. Oh, there was something about um, sources and autobiography. Um, yeah, I. It, this is one of my first times working with kind of memoir um, and autobiography. And um, I was brought to it. I, there was also a question in the chat about why I was kind of brought to it. Um, so one of the reasons I was brought to it was partially a COVID thing <laughs> in terms of trying to uh, produce a PhD without kind of access to archival resources and, and certain kind of forms of interviewing that I was hoping to do. But at the same time, um, I, I kind of happened upon um, a biography by a um, by a, a Gujarati British person who's like a member of the House of Lords in the UK, and I thought it was really interesting um, that he just a just like what compelled him to write um, an autobiography, um, and and he kind of reverts back and talks about Mehta and he talks about another industrialist Madhvani who um, are all, who was also operating in Uganda. And I just thought it was really interesting that there's this kind of genre of, of um, Gujarati businessmen who were in Uganda, who decided to kind of document their lives in this way. Um, and what's quite interesting is in the case of Mehta, um, he, I think in part, and this is just like my assumption, was compelled to write this biography because S.K. Patel, who I put him in conversation with towards the end of the, um, towards the end of the paper, he, um, in his launching of this kind of Indian diaspora organization called the Briha Bharatiya Samaj, he is trying to encourage um, Indian diaspora in Uganda and East Africa kind of more broadly to kind of write about their experiences because there are very, very few accounts of these experiences. Um, and it seems to me that Mehta's biography kind of follows soon after that. So, so it is, there is something kind of maybe interesting going on here to think about. And another really interesting thing too is that um, apparently Mehta, himself actually couldn't read or write. And so he actually dictated this biography to someone who then wrote it down in Gujarati and then it was translated to English. So that adds this kind of extra level of complication in terms of, you know, what did he actually say? What, what can I simply capture this of translation? Um, part of it's about kind of grafting this micro onto macro. Um, historical de detail, but I think what these biographies do illuminate is is something that you can't really find in, for instance, a formal archive. Um, and in many cases, these individuals might no longer be alive, or if you were to interview kind of family members who continue have, to have significant business interests in East Africa, um, again, you're, you're dealing with this multiple process of, of translation. So I think it's quite it's quite illuminating and it's guided me in the archive itself to kind of look at sources I probably wouldn't have looked at anyway. So it's a really, it's a fun kind of process um, working between these two spaces. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that for then. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shika. And thank you, Professor Wright, for your insightful comments. And uh, um, we request members of the audience, if you have any questions, please type them. Um, the chat box or please raise your hand there is since uh, shika you have already dealt with the question from shaili matani like there is a question from uh, dr shushmita pati uh, and dr pati asks since you are speaking of industrialists from this is and this question is for sana um, since you are speaking of industrialists from different regions and regional networks do you see them deploying different strategies for consolidating regional politics in india Oh, well, yes, uh, very much so, because um, now if we were to discuss B.R. Shetty, and I think the prime uh, 
reason for worded for his downfall is also because he uh, started concentrating on furthering his uh, 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 you know a political career which he had very much started before uh, coming to UAE so he was basically looking for a long-term retirement plan by entering into the uh, uh, politics of Karnataka his home state and uh, uh, you know, what I also what I also mentioned in my master thesis was, uh, you know, uh, now uh, they have more reason to get involved in the political economy of. Uh, okay, please flag me if I'm breaking. Uh, to get involved in the political economy of India uh, after the arrival of Modi, um, uh, because uh, you know the, the whole pro business outlook of the Modi government. Uh, enables them to not only focus on their home states, but also uh, uh, look for projects, you know, in other parts of India. And uh, so there, uh, apart from Shetty, there is another healthcare baron, uh, Shamshir Vayal, who is, who is from Kerala. And uh, in 2020, he, uh, you know, uh, initiated a petition uh, to, um, you know, for getting NRIs, non-resident Indians in the, uh, in the UAE, and I think uh, generally, uh, you know, to speed up their voting rights process because it still remains very convoluted and very complex for non-resident Indians to vote in the general elections of India. So uh, I guess they are very much connected to the uh, 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 the political economy of India, and especially with the arrival of Modi, uh, they are very much looking to invest and secure their business interests uh, in India. I hope that answers most Thanks. of the Thanks, uh, Sana, uh, for your response. Um, are there any further questions uh, from the audience? Um, please feel to raise your hand or type your questions. And if not, um, we just have you know a couple of minutes left, so we can end this session. I just want to, again, once again, thank uh, the faculty discussions, Professor Wright and Professor Chuck for joining us and for providing us with your comments. Um, I also want to thank the panelists, Shika, Bing, and Sana uh, for your wonderful papers. And uh, all of us learned so much and from these papers and we really enjoyed them. And if any of you have further questions, members of the audience, uh, please feel free to follow up uh, with the panelists. You can email them uh, to follow up. Um, and then our next session starts at 11.30, which is on resistance and solidarities. And so we look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again to the faculty discussants and the panelists. These were fascinating, wonderful papers. <laughs>